I've been wanting to teach on worship. I haven't done, I haven't taught on worship here in a couple of years. And um, I've wanted to teach on it because <clears throat> it can mean so many different things in our culture. It can mean anything from a life devoted to God or a genre of music. So depending on what context, the word worship can mean a whole lot or very little. And um, if we only see worship as merely, let's say, a genre of music, something that we enjoy because it makes us feel good to sing certain songs and that is when the band sings the songs that we like. And as a worship leader, it's something I've heard often over the years, like, well, worship was good today. You guys did all the songs I like. I'm so glad I was completely aiming for you. Psych. Your generation doesn't say psych, though. <laughs> Sal Jr. says psych, though. We're, we're from that generation, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, you guys can sit down if you want. Just whatever you want to do. Just receive. Just keep receiving. Um. Whenever I talk about worship, again, it's so important that we, I love definitions. I think most of you that have been a part of this ministry for a minute, you know that Gabriel loves definitions. Because when you're talking about something like worship, um, as I've already stated, it, it can mean any number of things. Just like if, if we were to be up here talking about fathers, um, the term father, the title father can come with it very contrasting definitions. Some are very sweet and pleasant and some are painful, very painful. So one term, very, very different ways of looking at it. So when, when I teach on worship, and this is something I learned back in my days at, at uh, Christ for the Nations. Christ for the Nations in the house. Whoop, whoop. Um, was that everybody was coming to me with their opinions about what worship was. And everyone was correct. Everyone had, you know, their conviction as to what worship was. But they were all different. They were all correct, but they were all different, which is confusing. I'm not going to go into that right now, but... It was during that season that, that Holy Spirit gave me the way to sum up the way we look at worship and how we define it. So the way I define it in this house and these worship musicians understand <clears throat> is that worship is, when we use the term worship in this house, it means to appropriately respond to God's presence. And that's why I wanted to teach you on the seven Hebrew words for praise tonight because worship is not just one thing. It, it has many members to it, many functions, many tools that are associated with it, um, many responses, if you will. And bless you. And um, the more we learn to graft these responses into us, the more whole, I believe, we can become. Um, just like tonight, as we just, many of us just laid out in the presence and in doing so received healing, received peace. Did anybody testify to that? Anybody get, feel like, whoa, God really downloaded some stuff to me. 
That's because we're learning how to respond to him appropriately. Um, in my younger years of getting into worship and stuff, I didn't know anything about the seven Hebrew words of praise. Or I didn't know anything. I just, I knew that God was holy and he was good and he was kind. And there were so often in worship, even though I was an introvert, I felt this, this internal struggle between needing to be composed and wanting to be an absolute basket case for Jesus. Like I wanted to be, I wanted to be passionate. I wanted to be one of those people that just didn't seem to care. Almost felt like, like it was in me to do so, but I couldn't explain it. I didn't understand it. Well, then years later, I would come across this Old Testament example. And you might be wondering, like, well, why do we have to go all the way back to the Old Testament? Because we don't, we don't worship like, like they did. We don't sacrifice animals and, and do all that. Um, well, it's important because it's where it all came from. Okay? It all, the foundations of our faith started there and continue throughout into today, and it doesn't, the word never contradicts itself. And uh, when, we, when we note uh, scripture, when we note worship throughout scripture, we see that from the very first mention to its last, every, men, every mention echoes the same intention. So correct, we don't worship via slaughtering bulls and lambs and things like that. But the, the intent of it is still echoed in what we offer today in sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, which we're about to cover. So I can probably move this, move through this relatively quickly. I've never taught when it was so quiet like this. Because it's about to get a little, a little, bit, a little bit loud. All right. The first word, if you want to take notes. Any note takers? Did you bring your Bibles? How about that? Let me see them. Good, 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 good. Good. A Bible-carrying Christian is a dangerous Christian. That is, if you crack it open, you got to pull a sword out of its sheath, otherwise it doesn't do much good. All right. So the first word is halal. Do we have these on the screen? Are we doing that? <laughs> yes. I love this. Okay. Halal, it means to boast, to glory, to celebrate clamorously or be loudly foolish. That's Bible. Do you know why this feels weird? Well, first of all, this, this word halal is where we get the word hallelujah. To basically to halal yah or Yahweh. So when we say the word hallelujah, it means to be foolishly, clamorously praiseworthy towards God himself. Now, one of the reasons why we feel so weird in church when it comes to being ah, is because we've reprogrammed ourselves to sing that word completely stripped of anything that would be extroverted. So pretty much any, any song that I can think of at the top of my head that has the word hallelujah in it is slow. Here's one that's been sung for generations. Alleluia. You know that one? Alleluia. Alleluia. 
It's a wonderful song, and I don't mean to, I'm not trying to bash it. It's been used millions of times to usher in some beautiful moments with the Lord. It has. But let me tell you why it's weird now that you know what it means. Because what you're really singing is, Celebrate clamorously, or be loudly foolish. Does this look loudly foolish? Does this look clamorous? That patch, by the way, is stupid good. Fixing to go interstellar on us. Nerd worship. Um, where was I? Hello. Yes. We don't even know what to do with ourselves in this kind of worship. I mean, it's literally telling us to be clamorous and loudly. Anybody want to, anybody want to be foolish in church? Loudly foolish. We, we want to be, but we're all so scared to death. <laughs> We'll go into more of that later. Yeah, we feel this, we feel this need to just be. So it's it's not, understand me. I'm I want us to I want us to recondition ourselves that when we say hallelujah, it's meant to explode out of us. And one of the reasons why, oh, here's a story. So years ago, I worked with, um, I was talking to this worship leader. And, um, and any worship set they did, they wanted to go just straight to the deep end of the pool. What do you mean by that, Gabe? Holy of holies. You are holy. Just right there. Just stay there the whole time. And I was like, bro, I get it. I mean, no place I'd rather be than in the Holy of Holies. Just I want to be right there in that vertical space. I don't want to do anything else. However, it's important that we also include songs of praise, songs of self-examination, you know, all the stuff that we kind of find throughout the tabernacle. What's the tabernacle, Gabe? Look it up. It's in the Old Testament. Um, well, when, when I mentioned it's important to do other songs that celebrate and things like that, their response to me was, well, if I had to lead worship as much as you do, I would probably do a lot of throwaway songs too. That's when you're supposed to go, ooh, there are no throwaway songs to God. And I said, it's important, it's important that we, that we, in our set planning, when we lead congregations in worship, or when we come into a place of worship, congregational praise, when, when, the, when the band is, is singing something that is telling every cell in your body to dance, that you should probably do so. Those songs are important because they, they give us an opportunity to see a different facet of God's nature. But I think almost more importantly is it forces us to show God parts of ourselves that maybe we're not comfortable with. Because back in my younger days, look, you've heard me say so many times, in my late teens through my 20s, I was so depressed, so angry, just dark. I was just this ray of dark shine everywhere I went. And I would darken every room that I walked in. And during that season, I was learning how to be a worship leader. Um, I was moody. Gosh, I was moody. I was, uh, talk about being soul driven in all the wrong ways. Um, I was just moody. I was just depressed. If I was in a bad mood, if you tried to encourage me, I'd pull you down in the hole with me. And uh, I was oh, so pleasant. Um, I was telling uh, Jeremy Bishop, Prophet Jeremy Miller earlier 
today. It was like, if you could just go back in time and just observe me for like 30 minutes, you'd be like, wow, God can do miracles. Anyway, during that depressive season of my life, I loved depression. Man, we were best friends, depression and I. And uh, I, I could come into a worship service where people were kneeling, maybe even crying, and just, just sweet, kind of like what we had earlier, just really sweet. I could come into a worship service like that. Hi, Brie. I didn't see you earlier. I'm just, okay. Um, I could come into a worship set like that that was just beautiful and sweet presence. I could come into one of those with depression, with anger, all the stuff that makes you do this, and fit in. Because I look like I'm just being, you know, composed in this very quiet moment. But when I come into a worship service and people are praising and it's exuberant and it's dancing and they're spinning and uh, flags going nuts. Um, well, now there's a demand that's put on me. Now I stick out like a sore thumb. So now I have to make a choice to either willfully stay in that place of despondency and anger, whatever else I'm carrying, or submit to the, submit to the environment and respond to him in the way that's appropriate in that moment. Where when I do that, by even just choosing to make that choice, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna lay aside my rights to depression, my rights to anxiety or whatever else I'm carrying, and I'm going to submit every fiber of my being to praise him right now, whatever that looks like, in an extroverted fashion, I get healed in that moment that I choose to carry him instead of that. So again, earlier we responded to him appropriately. We're just laid out on the floor, we're just receiving. But I want you to learn these other tools, these other responses, because the more you, you give yourself in obedience to worshiping him the way we're biblically mandated to do so, the more whole I believe you will come, you will become. Are you tracking with me so far? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So I uh, should have read these earlier. I forgot to read this. Where are we? Um, here it is. Now, when, when we read, when we read in the, uh, the Psalms, for example, the, the original Hebrew writers, they didn't use generic terms like praise or worship. They didn't do that. They used these very distinct responses throughout the Psalms. So like when we read in the English, like this is uh, Psalm 69 verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. Now, depending on how I want to interpret the word praise as an introvert, that doesn't have to mean much. I praise you, God, mm, with a song. <laughs> but if I read it in the Hebrew, it's actually saying, I will halal the name of God with a song. Uh-oh. That doesn't give me permission to be passive. Let heaven and earth halal him, the seas and everything that moves in them. I'm really wrecking this for you, aren't I? I'm so happy about that. All right, word number two. We are trucking right along. Yada. Give thanks, praise with lifted hands. Zach, I'm gonna think about you every single time I teach about this now, because you told me that story, wherever Zach went. So a yada is hands lifted, but some of us are into the half yada. 
it's like the New Testament version. We're more composed now. We've got it pretty figured out so we can just I mean, it's like, it's the universal sign for surrender. If somebody came in with a gun and said, raise your hands, you'd be like, surrender. This is me surrendering. Psalm 35, 18. I will give thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. But in the Hebrew, it would have said, I will give you yada in the great assembly. It means in the great assembly, now I'm going to stand there with hands lifted. I'm going to give you thanksgiving with hands lifted. And I will halal you among many people. Number three, tauda. Thanksgiving, a thank offering. Sacrifice of praise, a choir of worshipers. We've got tauda on these risers every Sunday. giving a thank offering. It's, it's, an, it's a type of praise that has, that's infused with gratitude. It's not merely just thank you, God. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing, Psalm 107, 22. Or let them sacrifice the sacrifices of tauda and declare his works with rejoicing. So let them bring gratitude-infused praise offerings to me. If I have gratitude, why do I have gratitude? If I have gratitude for something, why is it that I have gratitude? It's because I'm aware of what I've received. It's so important that when we stand here in worship, we're not just letting words just come out, but we we place our thoughts, we bring everything into alignment. When I'm singing thanksgiving to, to God, I'm singing not just words, but I'm singing with an understanding. You gave your life for me. You set me free from depression. And it's from this testimony of gratitude that I give you this praise offering. Zamar, number four. To sing or give praise while plucking the strings of an instrument. I get to Zamar all the time, which is why I have long fingernails on one hand and not the other. If you've ever looked at my fingers and thought, does he do crack? No, he doesn't do crack. He plays acoustic guitar, finger style. So short nails on one hand, long on the other. It's always annoyed me. I've had it for 30 years and it still bothers me, but hey, they have function always ready to give zamar. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully or zamar with a shout of praise, a shout of joy. Number five, tequila. Not to be confused with tequila. This is not tequila worship. This is wormless, wormless worship. Tehillah is to glory, celebrate praiseworthy deeds with song. Uh-oh, my fellow introverts in the house, this last part. Sing enthusiastically. Worship more with just our brains. But you are holy, you who inhabit the praises the Tehillah of Israel, Psalm 22, 3. Tehillah from the upright is beautiful. Not again, not just praise, it's celebrative in its praise, it's enthusiastic. Oh, in, a, in Isaiah 61, 3, where it talks about um, exchange a spirit of heaviness for for a spirit uh, a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness that word praise there is tehillah again so he gives us a garment of celebrative praiseworthy 
and enthusiastic worship. He gives us a garment of that as opposed to like what probably a number of us carried in tonight, heaviness. By the way, you look gorgeous when you wear praise. Not so much heaviness, but you look really good. We should all change out our wardrobe just, just to praise. Number six, Barak. To bless, to praise, to kneel. And remember, a position of kneeling is a position of humility. So Psalm 90, 95, 6, 6, B, as I have noted here, let us barak before the Lord our maker. Or Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. Think about what he's saying. Barak the Lord, O my soul. So he's telling his soul to come into a place of humility. But I don't have control over my soul. I just feel what I feel. Ah, 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 ah. I love that about David. He's so honest in his worship to the Lord. Okay, soul. Bless the Lord. Barak the Lord, oh my soul. Come into a place of humility. Kneel where he is Lord, where he is higher than we are. Acknowledge his greatness. And in that place of lowered posture before the Lord, find wholeness, my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. Come into alignment with his Lordship through humility. Emotions, you are not my Lord. Raging thoughts, you are not my Lord. Barak the Lord, O oh my soul, come into alignment with his Lordship. Come on, this is good, guys. Final, finally. Number seven, Shebach. When I first learned this, I thought it was Shabak. I guess I pronounced it the white way. And um, this is at Christ for the Nations. And one of my bass players at the time, Benny, uh, he's from Israel. And he came up to me one day, he's like, Gabriel, it's not Shabak, it's Shebak. <sighs> With phlegm at the end of it. <sighs> Shebak. This is a fun one to praise, to shout, and proclaim with a loud voice, to boast in the Lord. Psalm 63, three, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall shebach you. Psalm 145, four, one generation shall shebach your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I don't know if you noticed, but of all of these responses that are listed, again, these, these are throughout the Old Testament and into the new, okay? This is not, it's like, well, after Jesus died on the cross, we don't have to do that anymore. Ha, <laughs> no. No, we still have an, an open, not merely invitation. through these responses that, that scripture gives us, not many of them are introverted, which is a real bummer, speaking from experience. I mean, it, it, give me your best introverted Shabach. Go ahead. You're screaming in your mind right now. <laughs> it doesn't work. You can't. You can't, you can't allow your personality to dictate what kind of worshiper you're going to be. You allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and Scripture to draw the lines for you, to create a framework. 
And it's in this framework that we learn we actually have permission beyond a permission. We actually have, what's the word I'm looking for? I keep not thinking of this word. Directive. That'll work. We have a biblical directive to be absolutely passionate lovers of God. But Gabriel, if I do that, it's not my personality. It's going to violate my personality to, to worship the way that scripture says I'm supposed to. And I need to be true to myself. No, you need to be true to who he is. He is Lord, not you. There's a whole lot in scripture that my flesh is not real crazy about. But who is Lord? If he's Lord, then it doesn't matter what my vote is. I don't get a vote. I get to do what he says I need to do. And in, and in pursuing what he's given me to do, like in this case, these seven words, these seven responses that I have to his presence, that I have to his nature, as I willingly graft them into who I am, I discover I'm a whole lot more than I talked myself into being. I'm a whole lot more than culture ever gave me permission to be or the church for that matter. So tonight there's, there's not like, a, like an altar response, like come up here if you wanna shabak to the, no, I'm not gonna do anything like that. But I want you to legitimately take these tools and begin to ask Holy Spirit to graft them into your heart and give you, maybe you're not willing to be foolishly, clamorously worshipful to Jesus. Maybe you're not willing. You're like, that's just too much for me. Look, but can I ask you this? Can you at least ask, ask Holy Spirit to make you willing to be willing? Have you ever prayed a prayer like that before? I'm not willing, but I'm willing to be willing. It's the gateway drug to passionate, passionate obedience. Like, God, this is really hard for me. I don't even see how this is ever gonna work, but I'm willing to consider it if you'll walk with me. Okay, so I've not given you biblical permission to demonstrate ex extravagant worship. What I hope you understand is that you have a biblical directive to be extravagant worshipers. This is not about doing something, this is about becoming something. It's in your nature. Your DNA was designed to do this. But, In spite of hearing this information, and you know it's biblically true, your spirit's probably going, yes, I know that to be true. But in, in spite of that, in spite of the truth that you know you just heard, how many of you still feel like, like you're almost hardwired to be composed in worship? Be honest, that's me. Still sometimes this battle like, ah, oh, I'd like to spin around and be foolish, but <sighs> do you know why you feel that way? Come back next week and I will tell you. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm, I'm gonna tell you next week and it's gonna blow your mind. It's one of my favorite teachings. Outside of teaching this, my second favorite thing to teach because it helps us understand that we've been robbed because we have. It's like I said, you were created to be an unabashed, passionate worshiper before God. But somewhere a long time ago, someone told us that it was inappropriate 
And 1,400 years later, we're still swallowing the same lie. All right. Well, we haven't done announcements yet. Jeremy, do you want to do you want to add anything to this before we move on to anything special? With no, cool. Well, let's let's stand and and pray, but don't leave yet because we're still gonna we still got to do announcements and we'll do some housekeeping stuff and, and then we'll kick you all out of here. Um, also, let me make this clear to a uh, uh, prayer team. Whenever we're done, please come up to the front. And if you came tonight, you need partnership with somebody to pray with you over family, over fine, anything, anything. You stubbed your toe on the curb walking in tonight. Somebody will pray with you. Um, but they'll be up here. They'll be available for you whenever we're finished. But uh, go ahead, Jeremy, come on up here and give us, uh, give us some instructions.